science classroom that has desks with rolling or tables with rolling chairs. So we're making some progress here. Um, we're shifting towards to this class to be peer to peer and it's very close and mostly case based with interspersed with mini lectures. Um, students have a homework system. They're required to do their reading and prepare ahead of time and complete the homework before coming to class. And we have five TAs, which is just a blessing, who move around and facilitate the kinds of teaching learning that we want to see. Here's our challenge, though. Some of our students, and I'm sure you've heard this kind of thing before, are frustrated with the format of the class. They ask, why can't you just tell us what's going to be on the test? <laughs> And why can't you tell us what we need to know? Part of that, I think, we wonder if it's not, I mean, there's, that is always somewhat of a student, uh, uh, student conversation, like just tell us what we need to know. But part of that is that anxiety, right? That they're somehow not being able to extrapolate from the cases that we're doing in class, the kinds of things that, the kinds of skills or the kinds of thinking or um, the kinds of practice they need to uh, apply that to the exam. So they're constantly worried they're missing something. Um, and for many of our students, especially our nurses students, who are sophomores, our senior students do something a little bit different. But our sophomore students who are trying to get into the nursing program, this is not, this is, this is a live or die class. If you don't get a B in this class, you have to take it over and your whole career is pushed back a year. So it's a big deal for these students. So while we're like, yeah, we're not gonna tell you what's going to be on the test. We do understand that point of view, and we do want to put something, uh, find a solution to help them, help scaffold them up to um, being feeling like they're more competent on the exam. And then we have introductory physics. This, depending on the semester, is 800 to 1,000 students per section. Um, we are well into the process of having created active learning strategies across all aspects of the course. That means discussion lab and our role class meetings. And it's, our methodology is really peer-to-peer -peer learning and group problem solving. Uh, we're gonna be talking about the problem that we had in lab this semester. Um, we had 10 design-based labs, which is really cool, inquiry-based, very different from what physics used to be. Um, and students are to work together in lab to, and they all receive a group base grade. It's mostly for physics to write in low stakes so they don't have to like, get mad at each other. The challenge is that we're encouraging students to work with different people for each lab. They don't, that's a different challenge. I look in, I'm looking at Courtney because she might have an idea or solution we could talk about before. Um, so we are trying, we tried to figure out how do we, at least this first time around, facilitate that kind of grouping and efficiently assign grades. That's the lesson learned. So I'll tell you about that in a bit. So let's take a look at the material science and engineering group win one, that students are our solution to this problem, to get students to come to class and be prepared for class, is that they're given the opportunity, and I always try to phrase it as that, to show what they know when they come to class. Instead of being, they get to take a quiz, it's a five minute quiz, five questions at the beginning of class. It's graded, it's relatively low stakes, but the scores add up. So you're, instead of looking at it necessarily as being punished or punitive or a pop quiz, this is their opportunity to kind of show what they know and get rewarded for doing their work. It's a daily at the beginning of each unit, every class. So three times a week, these classes. What's nice, and I'll show you this in a minute, is that the instructor immediately sees the, sees the trends and can spend a little bit more time on the concept, on the uh, concept. So he's kind of using this as a formative assessment too. This is something that our instructor is getting used to, so we're working that into the practice. And what we saw when it was implemented last semester, very um, in, in kind of in a rough way, but it was fine, is that lecture attendance remained high. Now there's lots of quizzing tools and applications you can use to do this, but what we used were just in class um, Canvas quizzes. Let me pop that one up. And this is what they look like. The students come to class, uh, okay, so the students come to class. They're given, um, our instructor, he doesn't start like right at the minute class. You know, he doesn't 
warm up. So here's the kids still coming in. And you give them a time slip. And they have opportunity, this is individual, to answer pretty conceptually based questions. Not a lot of, not, it is engineering, but these aren't for computational based questions. So that gets the students there, they get their point, they get rewarded for coming to class. Hopefully they have done enough reading. What's kind of nice about this, as I said before, is that we see um, exactly what the students are struggling with. So if you've never done this before, after you've given a quiz, up here in the uh, your right hand corner, uh, we have quiz, quiz statistics. And what, um, uh, what our instructor can do is just click on that real quick and skim. And he's not even necessarily looking. He can even cross his map better than I can because he's taking more information. But he's looking to see these numbers. So mm, half the class did all right. Pretty good on that question. Pretty good on this question. But as he's going through and teaching, most likely he's going to stop and spend a little bit more time on this question and try to parse out what the students were having a challenge with. So right there in, in, in class, he is getting ready to change his instruction. And that feels a little weird for instructors, especially instructors who have been literally by the book or literally by the PowerPoint, to be willing to like change it on the fly. But yeah, go is, for it. Is the instructor showing the students these statistics? No. Okay. But if you use something like TopCat or something like that, that would show up. This is just for his um, own editing up his uh, kind of in situ. Um, Although an instructor but, could. I, yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah, that is a, you know, that's not personal data, that's aggregated across the course, and it would help make the argument, hey students, pay attention, 46 of you, 40, 54 of you got this, percent of you got this wrong. That's, you know, you should listen to me. Okay. This isn't in this course, but one technique, as long as we're talking about this technique, that I've seen our physicists, the physicists I work with, is when they see something like that, they, they, they use a polling system, but they say, turn to your neighbor and have a conversation. What do you think went wrong? And that might be something that we can, we're trying to implement here too. And then they get a chance to try to process it, figure it out, maybe make a prediction about what's going wrong, or what they missed, or maybe their peer got it right and they got it wrong. And then the instructor will go over it a little bit more. I do a spin on that. Yeah. So, um, I use the team-based learning approach. Mm -hmm. And so they take this quiz individually on Canvas when they arrive in class, and then they immediately go to their group and they take the same quiz together as a group so that my 54% who got that wrong get to hear from their peers who go, no, 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 it is not the I know why, it's because X, Y, and Z, and then the peers are teaching the peers what is correct. Exactly. Exactly. Now, I don't know how many of you have tried some of these methods. Come on in, Cliff. I've tried a lot of these methods, um, and you get student feedback like, I don't want peers teaching me, or I shouldn't have to teach myself. A lot of this takes some preparation at the beginning mm -hmm. and convincing, and maybe you don't get them all convinced, but you, if you, anybody thinks about how they learned, it wasn't because you sat there and just told them all to us, right? It's because you had to kind of teach yourself. That's part of the experience. So that was win number one. In our anatomy class, we had win number two. Um, so we have basic idea, same thing, uh, in class quiz for just the point for participants, basically. Um, and they get an example question that they would see on the exam during class. And this is all facilitated on Canvas. And what they used to do is they pop up this example question that I used in class, um, and they can talk to their peers. They can try to figure it out, and then everybody must answer on their own. It's basically like using a, a polling top hat or icebreaker system. But our instructors did not want to um, have the students have to pay for anything else. So they're like, oh, we have Canvas, we can do this in Canvas. So let's just use Canvas. Uh, and what happens is, because we're also working on the logic of how things are working in the human body, they go through and work through this clinical case and show their expert reasoning um, of how 
they would approach it. None of these cases, but I'll show you. Just so you get an idea. It's a little different than you might see a case in a more medical, like a higher level medical or med school type of class or affiliated in health system. But they're, they're starting to, one of our goals is starting to, um, as they have said, think like a practitioner. So how do the practitioners approach problem solving? Um, so this is the kind of case that they're given. Uh, you're a student, nursing student, you've got a nurse, you have a local or your care fund as a seven-year-old boy that you brought in for urgent care by his mother. He's very pale, and I have the RU school around, but mother reports that a child has umbilical and lower right quadrant pain. And he vomited the first day and the pain and he has been not vomiting since, so the pain exists. The patient has no desire to eat, the pain began, and now has a high fever and chills. Upon examination, um, child enters and reports pain. Um, and I don't like the quadrants are wrong, so sorry about that. Um, when it is percussive, yeah, we just kind of broke this one yesterday, so we just had to rest a little bit. So then they start to list some findings, and all they're asked to do is look at anatomical uh, anatomical structures in that region, they think he might be a cancer. Uh, they're not being graded on accuracy. They're not being graded on, in fact, we don't want them to make any sort of diagnosis. That's not the level that they're at. But they might make a guess because they have some background experience in that. <coughs> but that's not what they're, they're looking for. So that's what they do in these case-based structures. And as I said before, some of them are having a hard time transferring that to what a, a scan looks like. So what we've done is, like I said, we have these little practice examples. We'll have one or two questions. Interspersed, we use it as a formative assessment activity, kind of like a case. But this is a question that they might see on an exam, similar to the case, similar but kind of a mini case. You're playing backyard football, you don't put a ball, just look at your shoulder. Um, when you stood up, went back in, but now they could not, you don't have full range of motion, pretty much. And they're asking what nerve or the brachial plexus is to be injured. So they have to reason through what happened to try to uh, figure that out. Um, so they do that, they work together, they talk to, get to each other just like what they were just explaining, and then uh, they make a guess, and then our instructor, so, um, we have two of them, will go through and talk. It's not about the right answer necessarily, about how they came up with the right answer, or how they put the question together to start with, so that the students are getting a little idea of, this is the approach I should take when I get to this exam. And it's kind of scaffolds them in between these, the case study and the, and the kind of thing that they need to do very quickly on an exam. So those are the two wins. Again, nothing revolutionary, just a story of how we use in-class quizzing. But now everybody's favorite part, when things don't go well, because we're human. We have a physics, lesson well learned. Here's the situation, we are organized um, we have organized by labs, grouping and tool. Uh, we're using the grouping tool in Canvas. We have the grouping tool organized by labs. So the idea was that students would come in to their lab section, find their lab section and their table, and I'll show you, it's hard to conceive, so I'll show you this in a minute, and they just take their name and slide it over to the group. And then they do their work, and then they're given a group grade at the end. One grade for everybody. Here's the issue. So there's 10 labs per semester. There are 27 sections. And in each section, there are 10 groups. So if my math is correct, that means over the course of the semester, students, we, Canvas had to deal with 2,700 separate groups. Okay? Here's what happens. Canvas doesn't like that at all. <laughs> So it would sit there and load, and load, and load, and load, and never load. We could not get the group tool to load by the end of, even by the end of class. So students were getting frustrated. They were worried about their grades. Um, so our lesson is that we will not be using the grouping tool on Canvas, or at least grouping tool as it is. Right now, TAs are going to be, the students will have to hand in a paper with their group's name on it, and TAs are just going to have to grade them by hand for students. And we built in. We've adjusted their minutes that they're uh, working to accommodate that, but still, it'll be annoying. Cliff, it, uh, I'm sure you have a solution. Not a solution, but group tool. What, what do you mean, group tool? What's the group tool? Basically, I don't mean the group tool. I just, uh, 
I was thinking probably in detail terms, but you don't, well, let's look at it. The strengthening those yeah. are sort of those people in yep. those groups. So what I'm talking about specifically is this is that we want. We go to people and we have all of our students, that's right, and then we have the group status up here. So for lab one, we, we've got, I'm sorry, I'm breaking this up. I don't tell anybody, anybody can we're all cool with that. We've got, for example, here's session six of four. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight tables for them, the students to choose from. They would have on this, um, on the left hand side of the screen, skip their name and put it over into one of the groups. Um, that's the basic gist of it. Every single time. So that space is not full and they would have skipped by over and everybody's like, I don't know how to tell you this. And, you know, we didn't have a mechanism. We were trying to facilitate all of it on Canvas, and we did have a mechanism for students having them write down their name. Like we were handing out those cards, like cards on your Zoom can you tell us what you got. And we, we, uh, it was, they were frustrated. They liked the lab, but they were frustrated by this lab, as you can probably imagine. So, do you have any seen the issue with smaller classes? Not that I know of. This is the, we had no idea that this was going to happen. We just mm -hmm. assumed that this was a powerful enough tool to not, and it's not like there's one server under somebody's desk. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you with a hamster wheel in it. Like, we're not sure why this is, what what the problem is with this, um, but it's, it's a problem. So, and uh, we don't necessarily have a technical solution. And I guess in some ways that's okay, right? Those are small groups, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, these are the sheer number of groups. It's literally the sheer number of groups. It was literally like if there's the Intel processor was from like 2001. I don't know what that problem was. <laughs> but, but there was a problem and it was very frustrating. And because we don't have instructors in there, we need to, and there are TAs, and some of them are brand new teaching for the first time. So their classroom management is a little off as it is. Um, it's just one more thing, and they're just ready to explode. So here's the discussion for us. Instead of, like I said, this is more of an exchange. Instead of us having a time to work, in fact, you can get online and work. You can try some stuff out. We've got a couple of folks that work really closely with Canvas, like Cliff here, um, and try some stuff out. But I was thinking we could also have a discussion here about when you might use or examples like partners and giving, which is great, um, in class quizzing. Uh, what other technical solutions? By that I mean tools or pieces of paper, or the technology <laughs> you can do, that you might use to facilitate in class quizzing. This is one that I really, really, really want to have some ideas about. So if you have ideas about this for large, small lectures that maybe I can take and extrapolate it to large lectures, how do we more efficiently use technology, either high or pieces of paper even, to assess written feedback. So you saw from these quizzes that there are multiple choice. But what we're missing when you see multiple choice is how the students are reasoning and thinking through problems. And really, when we want to correct or help them or support them, we kind of want to know how they got to that answer, right? So we're missing that piece. And if we could speckle in some written feedback specifically, um, that would be fabulous. And then grouping solutions, I already saw that your name was on the uh, roster today, Courtney, who uses Kathy as a group solution. Um, so it needs these stories to tell. Horror stories are even more fun. John Martin. Can I ask for a clarification? Why do you want the physics groups to work with different students every? Oh, I was going to, that's in my notes. I was going to talk about that. It's still not kind of got to put my bottom of my coffee. I forgot that part. So here's what we know. We want to have some inclusive practices in our classroom, right? And you can defensively have inclusive practices, um, noting that some students aren't participating with each other, not talking to each other, um, maybe be for whatever reason, and there's so many of them, too many for us to get into, uh, whether it be stereotype threat or they just don't like other people <laughs> and they don't feel confident or they don't trust other people to help them with their work or they've had bad experiences with group work. You can try post the fact that you said, okay, work with other people. So they come into the class, they're working with everybody, the same people they're always working with, so that's comfortable and it's easy and 
some people are still left out. And now you have to manually move people and say, can you work with this person? Or I noticed you've never worked together and it's all this rigmarole and it's when you are a brand new TA, it feels weird. Like, if you're still worried that it seems like you, after a while you're like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta learn it anyway. But, um, uh, so there's all that, there's all kinds of things built into that. One of the universal design suggestions to have that is to pre-group students, right? To have students um, to enforce that by just giving assignments to the group. And for lots of reasons, inclusiveness, but we are also challenged doing that in our anatomy lab because we know they come in cohorts, whether they're um, uh, their athletic trainers or their team nurse in a coming cohort and they then join a class together so they tend to stick together but we know that especially in the medical profession and affiliated professions they need to be able to talk to each other even if it's very cursory and their very first time talking amongst their discipline different disciplines you want to give them that opportunity so there are low tech ways to make people group and then there are high tech ways to make people get into does that answer your question? That does, because my first thought was, you know, instead of 2,700 groups, if you just said five of them are, of the labs are going to be different groups, now you've only got half of right. 2,700, and if you say it's changed three times a semester, now you've got a much more manageable right. level. You still have a level of moving around from group to group, but you also increase their comfort with each individual group, so it's not just a first-time stranger meet, but uh, two or three times that we've talked and now I'm feeling right. more comfortable with you. Yeah. It might be a happy medium sort of thing. Great solution. You still have to force them to move through. You would still have somehow. to force them to move somehow, yeah. So you can do it the embarrassing way or you can do it secretly <laughs> with technology and that's just the way it is. Or uh, um, I've seen lots of different ways, even a deck of cards. Mm -hmm. Like today you're going to work, if you're a heart, you're working with hearts, fine hearts. And that worked with an instructor who initially pre-groups them and then after that initial pre-group and halfway through the semester, she says, okay, we're going to change groups up. You get to pick your own groups. So then they might go back with their own people or the people that are sort of the, she says, top performers in each group tend to cluster together and the, the bottom performers cluster together and they're happy that way. And they all increase their performance because they're by people that are more comfortable, I guess, more like them. I don't know. But work in the same direction. I have, I have never, I have got to see two phenomena that just self select like that. So, what do you think? Anybody have some ideas for us for especially the written feedback or how you've done it, even if you are teaching classes of 40 or 50 and not 500? Yeah, that's, that's cool. cool. Uh, I mean, I know. I and mean, uh, so, I'm in communication science and disorders, um, uh, undergrads and primarily grad students. And when I think back about your initial slide about we all have the same problem of getting students to come to class prepared, mm -hmm. and especially when um, like we don't know if they have a, a site class that has a huge project due, yeah. and so they're back burnering your class this week, right? Um, but I have found uh, in the team-based learning approach, they call them readiness assurance tests, or the awful acronym of RATS. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so they have a rat at the beginning of every unit, and this ensures that they have completed, at least skimmed, all of the readings, videos, whatever preparatory assignments they have been given. And so I have found it to be really useful. And um, I also teach a course that they all have to take, and probably about half of them are actually wanting to be in that particular class. Um, and so I have that 50% who isn't very motivated to do the readings and come to class prepared because it's not a high priority class for them. And doing the in-class quizzing at the beginning of class um, really has helped a lot. Do you think, and I was, I've been trying to sort of convince some of my instructors that there's a, there's a peer pressure element of oh, low yeah. stakes but with grouping. And I know as the kind of student I was, that if I came to class and I had to go talk to my peers and they would know that I was mm -hmm. not prepared, I wasn't prepared. Maybe some people aren't, but I was like, um, I didn't read last night, and, and I probably corrected that because I didn't want to feel that way anymore. Mm -hmm. 
You didn't want to do it in front of people down. Absolutely, because then I use Kathy at the end of the semester. Uh, there's a very small component of their grade, but it is just enough to keep them on their toes where they um, do an anonymous review of their group members. Mm -hmm. And that person who showed up with nothing to contribute every time and clearly was the social loafer, their grade will be impacted because they weren't coming to class prepared. And I make it really evident that the, what is the rationale behind what we're doing and that individual quiz that you take is part of your individual grade to show that you did your readings and you came to class prepared, and then that when they move into their team um, rack or their T rack, it is, <laughs> I, know, I know, I keep thinking, oh, I'd really love to change that. Um, but when they move into their team to take then again the same 10 questions that they just did independently, I make it really, really evident that this is to promote you discussing the course content, and it's also is a way for you to show an evidence to your peers, like, hey, I'm pulling my weight, I did my part, right? Um, and so it's so far been really, really good, and I've gotten pretty good feedback so far. At least I haven't gotten really bad feedback, right? Which is all you can hope for. How many others use in-class cuisine? And it, and it, here you can, we look at it like formal quizzes, like in quizzes <coughs> school, but it could be used in class ed or have folks, how many of you do pre-class quizzing? Okay. Is that like the homework quiz? Like in the class? Because uh, one of the thoughts that, that came to my mind is instead of taking up valuable in-class mm -hmm. time on uh, having people sit down and they take a quiz, uh, the graded surveys, for example, can help do that readiness assurance at least to the extent of it can facilitate that they've read through all or watched all the videos, read through all of the things, and then answered a question, even if it's not graded, the fact that they actually have to answer I think the question. adding the time component to that is huge because, um, so my course used to be a very lengthy evening course and it just got split to two times a week for a much shorter period of time then. And so I contemplated, am I gonna keep these in class quizzes? Yeah, it only takes 10 minutes, but it's 10 minutes that I only have 75 of, right? Um, but I really went back and forth with, I also don't want them doing open book. And they will, they will do open note, they will do open book, and that's the, I'm just skimming this while, and I'm doing it, they'll do it. They'll while do I'm doing it, while I'm doing it. Yeah, it. it'll be the Absolutely. first time that I cracked into that content when I take that quiz. And Which I is still better than nothing, but. <laughs> have to search for that answer and then plug it in. And your in-class, your group quizzing, I think is a wonderful way to have them teach each other and they do that time and encourage really discussion. Like, and I love one of the things that you mentioned earlier when you were talking about some of your problems that I can't remember which one it related to, um, but I thought, oh my gosh, that's what I get when I walk around the room and they're doing their group. I like get a little like instructor geeked out because I'm like, see, they're talking about it. They're actually, they're actually talking about course content. They're not talking about their weekend or they're not talking about another class or complaining about an instructor. Like they're actually on task talking like deeply. If we're talking about like Bloom's critical thinking, like they are using higher level critical thinking skills to talk about my course content. I'm like, eh. You have the added challenge of if they're your department, most likely they know a lot oh, about yeah. each other. So they're already mm -hmm. familiar with each other. Yep, which is also why I think that, and that, that, that's also why using the Academy grouping system can be really crucial because we get a lot of clicks already. Like our students who did our undergrad here in our grad program, they'll all click together. Do our, our like non-traditional students who are coming back for a master's degree, they all lump together. And I need that experience of those returning students spread out in all my groups, not all in the corner together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I had a question about your group quiz. Is, is both the individual and the group quiz both through Canvas? It's, um, I'm hoping to, I'm just moving in. I used Top Hat for the individual previously, but then um, the group actually, I 
I do a pretty structured team-based learning approach, and I use the um, on fat uh, tickets. Have you ever seen it? They're like scratch-off tickets. So. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Great. I was going to say. Like I, saw, so. I, saw, I saw somebody who used them. Yes, I love them. They work really great, and like it is also weird that they do get this. Um, strange satisfaction of scratching off and seeing the star underneath and they'll be like go team you know and they're like high-fiving each other and i'm like okay so this is building team rapport it's like the lottery it yeah. is like the lottery and at first they're kind of like what how does this work and then they really like it and so the so the group or the team quiz is using um then i just give them a couple of, well because they'll still be able to see the questions on canvas I all, that will also eliminate me having to like hand out a piece of paper with the questions on it and they'll be able to look at it and say well this is what I answered and so they'll have their discussion and then and then they all come to a group consensus and like whoever's got the card is like okay guys are we going B for sure we're, we're committed okay and then they scratch it off and then I hear the little eruptions when they were when they were going back and forth between two yeah it's really are they are they seated with their group when they're taking their individual quiz? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that everybody hands in their or turns in their individual quiz. Individual quizzes. individually and then they go together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, so it depends on the classroom. So like in the past, I did have um, like you described large tables with movable uh, wheels and chairs. And in that instance, yeah, they just sat down together and on their individual device took their quiz, closed it up, and moved on to their. But I have the option this time, the classroom will be in has some traditional seat, seating as well, and then tables, so they will be able to just seat themselves, start their quiz, and then they all move. And have them all move together, obviously, so they don't disrupt each other when they're What's What's the, the, the terminology for those quizzes? The actual the scratch off? Scratch off, yeah. Yeah, I believe it's an IFAT. IFAT? Um, yeah. So <laughs> So, I know they've got like the. Let me look it up and I'll find it for you. Ah, uh, yes. If I immediate, have, been, we have immediate feedback assessment technique. tool. So that's the IFAT. Um, and yeah, if you do, uh, go just type in team based learning I dash FAT. Yeah. It's not like 10 pages to Google in front of people. Is that all right? Yeah. Showed this to me, right? So you, you order them in a bundle. You order them in a bundle. There's like a key. 
Yeah. So you can right. the answer in the exactly. you write your questions in a way. Yep. That so the quiz that I just made for our first day of class is just a practice to teach them this process. And it's also, they have like a video uh, lecture of me talking about what team-based learning is. They get a little bit like a, another video to watch. Vanderbilt's got some really great stuff on their website. And then they're supposed to come to class and they have to answer questions like, the team-based learning process is blank. Here's your question, A, B, C, or D. And so it's an ungraded just practice. And so the one that I'm doing right now is running off of the set D032. And then my key tells me these are the correct answers for that set. And so then I just write my quiz accordingly. I believe Peter Van Ken and Kinesiology uses those as well, and he's talked to me about those in the past. I want to get like a little cohort together of people who use them and and actually, you know, because there's a lot of a lot of what you described is very similar to the team based learning yeah. approach. But I, you know, once you if you read the book, I think a lot of people really glom onto the true approach because it is evidence based, and he's spent a lot of time remedying a lot of the common issues that students hate to report because of. <laughs> and one of our biggest challenges when you're sitting in those big lectures is that, especially in our classes that don't have any TAs in them, um, and I've spent a lot of time teaching TAs how to get over their embarrassment of going and like, checking in and I, like, why are you on Amazon right now? Oh yeah. Yeah, like they have to get over that embarrassment, so, and they do. But, um, if you don't have that other those folks circulating, or you can't get in there because it's a weird six feet in this hall, how do we keep people accountable? And in a in a happy educational world, everybody would want to be learning for learning's sake. But that's not just we know that that that's just not sustainable for some of these kids. They're just they just need to get through it. They still need to be accountable. So trying to figure out ways in those big classes for them, like it's not an option for you not to talk to someone. You need to figure out a way to um, chat with somebody. And this goes against all of, you know, traditional education, especially traditional higher education culture, where the idea was to shut up and sit in the back and don't, don't make, don't interrupt the lecturer, you know, just be quiet and, and that's why they ask for, just tell us what's on the quiz. Make life easy the way that it used to be. <laughs> Once upon a time, maybe like 25 years ago, Badger Herald <coughs> had a daily paper, and in that daily paper was a daily crossword puzzle. And so you see, and I would never do this, but I heard that in some of these classes, you'd look out across, and it would just be kids doing the crossword puzzle. I mean, not me. And cheating, and the person in front of them, ooh, that's what <laughs> I never had to drop a class because I did too many bad crossword puzzles. <laughs> but um, yeah, that is. So how do we, if that's an attitude, and I don't know how to, you know, they come in from high school, and hopefully high school's adopted this, they're talking to each other, they're doing group work, they're doing group class, they come in here, and if they get their first few classes, are these big classes where they can sit back and they don't have to engage, it's easier not to, right? Cognitively, you don't have to put any work in. And we also know that when you cognitively not put any work in, you don't learn anything, just like anything, it takes a little work to learn it. Um, so they get used to it and they get mad. Mm -hmm. I think a little like bit said that it. you need that front loading of why this why this helped you learn. Yeah. Um, I think that's crucial. And that they that the whole first class is talking about why we're using active teaching mm -hmm. methods because they need to be on board and understand why. why. And if they do, then um, I find them to be more active and engaged rather than you just standing up and being like, this is what we're going to do. It changes the attitude about you, the instructor, that the students have. Not that, oh, they're punishing me by making me do this act of learning, but, oh, they actually care for me. And even though it's a little bit difficult and a little bit uncomfortable, I will actually learn better. Look, the research says so. And I believe the research says so in college. Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm. um, those of you who use, you have something to say. Oh, about I have that. a question. Those of you who use I, uh, Top Hat, what are your best strategies or thoughts on in-class quizzing with a thing like Top Hat or uh, Clickers or or whatever. Or different questions. Or other things. Too, because I know in I think your ABCDE, but in Top Hat you get the hotspots, you get the word, 
cloud, which is kind of cool. Um, I used the hotspot and I used multiple choice. The, the hotspot was nice for just engagement mm -hmm. because you're not going to get, you know, like quantitative information that you can use for grading, but they do like to see, like, for one example I had, um, they had to determine whether, because we're in communication, they, and they were undergrads, so an early concept was, is this expressive language that you're putting out, or is this receptive language that is coming into you, right? And I had uh, the, remember the tin can thing, right? So there was a boy on one end, like expressive was talking into the tin can, and a girl on the other one with it on her ear. And they even like that they choose the same spot to click on the picture. They'll be like, look, we're all clicking on the, if you're a oh, weird, I mean, it's like it is engaging for them. They found it like fun, but. I think there's something about that, um, and especially with traditional age college students, the need to belong or the need to be like other people. Like, oh, look, we've all come together with yeah. this part of the click on the tin right. can. So even though the, the picture is this huge square, like 75% of us all chose to click right on this big square. <laughs> all red right there. So this brings up a really interesting question about the diversity and inclusiveness. Those 25% that are, just are clicking red. elsewhere, do they feel like they're not part of the group? And what are some strategies that we can do as instructors to help them feel like they too belong. They need to. You're here, Cliff. I'm going to. I use Stop Hat. There's a, a lot of problems. I know some people will complain, but it's like, it's just, is the tool right for what you wanted it to do? In some things, people want it to do more than yeah. it is meant for and then they're not pleased with how it works. I had one colleague who seemed to have a lot of issue with students completing top hat activities outside of class, that she was running into a variety of different issues, but I only ran it in class. I do have a question for everybody that's still part of those discussion questions. So if Many of us have heard about the minute paper or like the, you can come up with any sort of written type of feedback for the funniest points. Mm -hmm. um, anybody using those and how are you facilitating them and how are you either convincing students to participate in that activity and do a quality job of reflecting versus like I'm just going to give you a point for turning this in and sometimes you have to do that. That's great. Mm -hmm. but, and then third, how are you looking at all those? And what are you doing with them? Anybody using those kinds of activities in class? I just started after doing Cassie and getting that awesome spreadsheet for you guys of all of those different audience points, 50 words, to like take you beyond pair and share kind Did of I thing. Did I give you that? I think it was and I it's a really great Excel document that has like all of these or a Word document maybe it's in a chart and it just has all of these different ways. And so I'm starting to include them and um, I was like for example, one is a fifty word just like free write about your thoughts about this. And I think that that also helps. I was debating like when to have them write because then they'll then talk about that in their groups um so i think it prepares them to actually have something to share because even if i pair my groups as well as i can they're always going to have that student who isn't comfortable or ready to talk to their group as much and i think having um, some of those structured activities then creates a format for them to be like, okay, well, I prepared my 50 words. I know what my points are. I know I can chime in on X, Y, and Z, or at least say, yeah, I put that in mind too, right? Um, and then as far as uh, how to count them, I think I've been, I've been including them as kind of like their participation because if I then have them, because any of those activities are really lending themselves to them discussing as a group thing, whether you do a pair and share, whether you like kind of a sharing out active approach. And so I figure it fits in the participation. I think that document that uh, Kurt was talking about is 
this leads to like 50 ways to blemish. There's one, and then there's the one I'm thinking about that says like easy to implement, easy to implement, hard to implement. Yeah. Oh, that's one? And yeah. I get a pile on, I don't know what to do with them. It's a pile on my desk literally right now. Oh, oh no. yeah. Right. I made it for specifically for the engineering, but I can go grab it. Yeah, that's the one where it's like just really easy to implement yes. in like the moment, and then those that are more involved for the right. bottom. I will, you know what, I'll give you guys the link to the tweets that I need that. And in, in the 50 Ways to Blend, we'll just put it on there. Excellent. We'll put them in the recap. And you can send the tip. And, we'll and the schedule. Like <laughs> <laughs> it was just approved yesterday. Well, you guys, thank you for participating, even though it wasn't overly easy. Like, to, like this is the new tool, but I like getting feedback. And you can see you guys, too. I don't get to come to these as often. Top of the thing, Marjorie, for coming back. And thank you all for coming back, and please uh, grab some more bagel and coffee, and uh, leave your evaluation forms. Uh, those help us again, as always. Kathy, is that school movie TBL too, or do they do it already? <clears throat> they were just starting, so you know they have that nice space, and so we're trying to encourage that use of it. But the you know the comfort level of being in a lecture hall is. Yeah. Just so great that I thought they suggest ways to kind of get them thinking about it. That's that's. Changing.